كما وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وبعد ان شاء الله تعالى يا اخوان we continue with the hadith of uh, the ifq of Aisha the great slander of our mother Aisha radiyallahu anha and as we talked about last week we began ikhwan showing the tremendous benefits that this narration brings reading from the likes of Ibn Hajar and from the likes of An-Nawawi and others and we'll continue tonight in that regard inshallah ta'ala continue to examine closely the hadith as known as the Qisat al-Ifq or the story of the great slander of our mother Aisha and that which is found therein Ikhwan from benefits regarding the issue that we began with some weeks ago or some months ago now in the affair of the evils of the tabloid culture and we'll connect inshallah ta'ala some of the benefits yani, regarding this narration to that which we are talking about as the coming lessons come on or come forward. So we begin, Ikhwan, with the statement of our mother Aisha from the narration, فَلَمْ يَسْتَنْكِرِ الْقَوْمِ خِفَّةَ الْهَوْدَجْ حِينَ رَفَعُوهُ وَكُنْتُ جَارِيَةً حَدِيثَةُ السِّنْ فَبَعَثُ الْجَمَلْ وَالسَّارُ نعم. And we mentioned last week, Ikhwan, where our mother Aisha, radiallahu anha, she firstly mentions the first reason why they would not have noticed, they would not have noticed her absence in the hawdaj, which we said is like the canopy, that is, it is placed over top of the riding animal. We mentioned what our mother Aisha mentioned, Ikhwan, was the first reason why they would not have noticed her being absent. And who remembers what that reason was? She was very light. She was very light in weight. And what was her reason for saying that she was very light in weight? Because the women of that time did not eat a lot of food. Al-ulqa, we said. Al-ulqa, we said. Huh? So she says now, Ikhwan, as we continue, so they would not have yani, felt any difference. They would not felt, have felt any difference in the weight of the hawdaj, in the weight of the canopy, when they lifted it. وَكُنْتُ جَارِيَةً حَدِيثَةُ sin. And I was a very young girl. So not only, Ikhwan, does she mention for us and benefit us that she was light in weight, she wasn't very heavy based upon the eating habits of the Arab of that time, but also, Ikhwan, because she was a, a girl of a young age. فَبَعَثُ الْجَمَلْ وَسَارُ So it mentions that once they put the hawdaj, the canopy, upon the riding animals, they drove the animals off without any uh, reckoning or without realizing that she was absent from the hawdaj. Ibn Hajjah says regarding the statement of our mother Aisha, that they would not have felt any difference in the hawdaj. He says, Waqa fi riwaya wa ma'mar thakal al hawdaj. And in this wording that I just read to you, it said, Khifat al hawdaj, yani the, the lightness. They did not notice any difference in the lightness of the hawdaj and the canopy. And in the wording that Ibn Hajjah is mentioning here, in another wording, he says, Thakal al hawdaj, yani the weight of the hawdaj, of the canopy. Now, we've talked about over the years, Ikhwan, the benefit of jama'a turaq the bringing together of all of the different wordings of a narration because you get a lot of different benefits when you see the different wordings. So this is one of the reasons that the ulama, they mention the different wordings. Ibn Hajjah goes into what one narration may say as opposed to another. And as we go through this narration tonight in the coming weeks, we'll strive to bring some of those benefits together inshallah ta'ala. And he said, well, awl Now listen, this is the benefit. Ibn Hajjah says the first wording is clearer. The first wording is clearer. The first wording is the lightness of the hawdaj, of the canopy. In this one it says the weight of the canopy. Now before I continue, why would you think that he would say the first is clearer? Ali. Ahsent. It's clearer because the khifa or the lightness goes in line with her already saying that she was light in weight. So you can see the connection in the wording there. So this is why Ibn Hajj says, يعني, that it was awdah. He says, لِأَنَّ مُرَادَهَا إِقَامَ عُذْرِهِمْ فِي تَحْمِيلْ حَوْدَجِهَا وَهِيَ لَيْسَدْ فِيهِ كَأَنَّهَا تَقُولْ كَأَنَّهَا لِخِفَةِ جِسْمِهَا بِحَيْثُ أَنَّ الَّذِينَ يَحْمِلُونَهَا حَوْدَجَهَا لَا فَرْ that's a very nice point. Ibn Hajjah says that is because what is intended here, Ikhwan, is that when they, or oh, she wants to establish her, you know, the excuse for those, uh, those men who are carrying the canopy, 
that when they lifted it, they didn't feel any difference. And she says, as if she is saying, because of the lightness of my frame of my body, my shape, because of the lightness of it, she says that those who lifted the holdage, the canopy, felt no difference whatsoever from my absence to my presence, whether I was present or absent. They didn't feel any difference regarding that. وَلِهَاذَ أَرْدَفَتْ ذَلِكَ بِقَوْلِهَا وَكُنْتُ جَارِيَةً حَرِيثَةً السِّنْ And he also says now that she's giving us something that is synonymous. Not only does she say that she was small in weight, but she also says that she was young in age. So she wants to, uh, she wants to give us, Yanni, emphasis to show us that she was a, not only a small girl, but a very young girl, which of course would have made her smaller than she would have been had she been uh, an, an older woman. So this ikhwan is her explaining for us the reason why they didn't notice her absence. The reason why they didn't notice her absence. And again, remembering that our mother Aisha, radiallahu anha, was a young woman, a young girl at the time. But look at her, yani her, her presence of mind. Look at her presence of mind to explain for us exactly why these men who were carrying the holders did not recognize that she was absent from the canopy. So then he goes on to say, Ibn Hajar says, وَقَدْ وَجَهْدَ الرِّوَايَ الْأُخْرَى بِأَنَّ الْمُرَادِ لَمْ يَسْتَنْكِرُوا الثَّقَلْ الَّذِي اعْتَادُوهُ لِأَنَّ ثَقْلَهَا فِي الْأَصْلِ إِنَّمَا هُوَ مِمَنْ رَقِبَ الْحَوْدَجْ مِنْهُ مِنْ خَشَبْ وَالْحِبَالِ وَالصُّطُورِ وَغِرْ ذَلِكَ And then Ibn Hajr goes on to say another reason perhaps why they didn't notice any difference is because the weight of the canopy itself is mostly made up of that which makes the hawdaj. That which the hawdaj is made of. And he mentions from wood and from rope and from curtains. So therefore, Iqwan, the fact that the hawdaj had, as we said, a wood frame, it had wood frame made from the, 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 the wood of trees, the likes of this, and also that it had from that rope, heavy rope to tie down, those that frame and also those curtains that would have to been thick so as to cover so that no one could see inside of the haldaj. So therefore this haldaj must have weighed something. You imagine it must have had something of weight to it. And that her sitting inside of it would not have added that much weight to the haldaj. She was a very small girl. And then he goes on to mention Ibn Hajar. He says after this, and he says, because of how thin and, and small she was, then her presence would not have added much weight. So therefore, they didn't notice much of a difference. So he says, therefore, this whole affair of the thaqal and khifa, the weight and the, uh, her smallness and the likes of this, he says, this is connected to the actual structure itself. أن الذين كانوا يرحلون بعيرها كانوا في غاية الأدب معها والمغالة في ترك التنقيب عما في الهودج بحيث أنهم لم تكن فيه وهم يظنون أنها فيه وكأنهم جوزوا أنها نائمة. And this is a beautiful point that Ibn Hajar mentions here, ya Akhwan. Ibn Hajar said, and there's another thing that we benefit here. There's another benefit that we take. That those who, يعني, you would be those who would direct the riding animal of our mother Aisha, those who put the canopy upon the animal, and they were the ones who would actually drive the animal, direct the animal. He, he goes on to mention that this shows, Ikhwan, that they had the utmost respect for our mother Aisha. They had the utmost respect and shyness regarding our mother Aisha. Why do we say, why do we think that he's saying, why is Ibn Hajj saying this? Abdul Aziz? They, they didn't care to check to see if she was in They wouldn't have thought to check, to ask her anything, to say anything, to look inside or anything like that. So this shows us that they had the utmost respect and honor for our mother Aisha, radiallahu anha. And he says, that they left off. They had no concern whatsoever of checking to see whether or not she was in the holdage or not. And it said, it is as if they thought that she perhaps was sleeping. It is as if they thought perhaps that she was sleeping, if she wasn't moving or anything, and they didn't want anything to do with asking anything or looking or anything like that. They just wanted to carry that whole dudge with the utmost respect, and perhaps she's sleeping. Huh? So this shows, Ikhwan, this is another benefit Ibn Hajar mentions, of the great honor and respect uh, that they had for our mother Aisha, radiallahu anha. And he goes on to mention her statement, وَكُنْتُ جَارِيَةً حَدِيثَةُ sin, That I was a very young girl. وَهُوَ كَمَا قَالَتْ and Ibn Hajj says, and she is as she has mentioned here. She was a very young girl. Because she, uh, yani entered, uh, yani the, she entered upon the Prophet's household after the hijrah in the month of Shawwal. 
And she was nine years of age. Yani, he says, after the hijrah of the Messenger of Allah Muhammad وسلم, in the month of Shawwal. In the month of Shawwal, and she was nine years of age. وأكثر ما قيل في يعني في في المراسيع كما سيأتي أنها عند ابن إسحاق كانت في شعبان سنة ست فتكون يعني لم تكمل خمسة عشرة. And he mentions and others have mentioned regarding the affair that she was it was in the month of Shaaban and that she had not uh, in the sixth year we should say the sixth year of the Hijrah of the Messenger of Allah Muhammad Sallam and she was therefore not older than the age of fifteen no older than the age of fifteen. And we know how the ulama have made sort of a jama'. Yani they have sort of uh, reconciled between the different ages that are mentioned. Some say he married her at the age of nine and entered her later, yani after the age of puberty. And this is what is mentioned uh, by some of the ulama regarding that matter. And then he goes on to say, And here we go again, Ikhwan. This is a beautiful point that Ibn Hajar makes. He says that what we benefit from this, Ikhwan, is Aisha, because she's mentioning that she was a very young girl, she's explaining to us why she was so busy trying to find that broken necklace of hers. Because this is something of the affair of the, of the, young, of the young, uh, young children, or the young girls, the young boys, or whatever it may be, that their hearts become attached to their objects. That whether it be their necklaces, uh, the young girls with their bracelets, or whatever it may be, young boys with their you know, toys, or whatever it may be, that they become attached to these things, and if they can't find them, then they become concerned and preoccupied with finding these things. So Aisha, by saying that she was a very young girl, Ibn Hajar says, it is if she's explaining for us why she was so busy trying to find this necklace. Because she was a young girl and she was very attached to it. She was a young girl and she was very attached to it. And he says, وَمِنْ إِسْتِقْلَالِهَا بِالْتَفْتِيشِ عَلَيْهِ فِي تِلْكَ الْحَالِ وَتَرْكُ إِعْلَامْ أَهْلِهَا بِذَلِكَ And also the fact that she didn't explain to anybody. Again, she was a young girl, which means she was inexperienced. She was, well, salam. She was inexperienced. So therefore, she's a young girl. She's not thinking about the caravan leaving and all those kinds of things. Her mind is preoccupied with finding this necklace. And therefore, she would not have said anything to the, uh, to, to the people. Rather, she would have been concerned about finding this particular necklace. She wouldn't have thought that they were going to leave her, as we'll see momentarily. And Ibn Hajj says, and that is because of her youth at the time, her very young age, and her absence of experience. And he says, in dealing with these kinds of issues, which is different if she had been older. Of course, if she had been older and had more experience, then it would not have been the same. As we'll see in a second, bi wa ta'ala. As we'll see that uh, in this instance, our mother Aisha, radiallahu anha, that she didn't even have someone who went with her when she went to go to the bathroom. But later on in this narration, we'll see that someone would now go out with her. When Mistah went out with her, when she got back to Medina, when she wanted to go out to the bathroom, she had a companion who would go out with her to go to the bathroom. So, as we said, in this instance, Yani, as Ibn Hajj is mentioning, she didn't have that experience of an older woman because she was a young girl at the time. So, therefore, some of these things that happened, she is explaining for us why she did them because of her youth. She is explaining it for us. And now we continue with the statement of our mother Aisha, radiallahu anha. فَوَجَتُ عِقْدِ بَعْدَ مَا إِسْتَمَرَّ الْجَيْشِ So I found my necklace after the army had continued, meaning to travel. فَجِئَتُ مَنَازِلَهُمْ So I came to their encampment. وَلَيْسَ بِهَا دَاعٍ وَلَا مُجِيبٍ And I didn't find anyone. Now imagine, a very young girl, Ikhwan. And she comes back to the encampment and no one is around. Imagine, she's a very young girl. And Ibn Hajar brings us some benefit regarding this. And he says... So I went to the place of where I was before, where my resting place was. And I thought in my mind that they would miss me and realize that I wasn't there and they would come back for me. Again, she's a very young girl, but here we see again the presence of mind. That inshallah they will realize that I'm not in the holdage, in the canopy. Uh, I'm not upon the travel and they will come back for me. Aisha says, and while I was sitting in that place of mine, then sleep overtook me and I fell asleep. And then she says, and I fell asleep, and she says, and then Safwan ibn Mu'attil, then after that he became a Zakwani, was behind the army. 
And we'll talk about sometimes in the armies they will have people to come behind to check things and to make sure everything is, is, is in order. And we'll talk about that later in Bi Ithnilahi Tabarak Ta'ala. Ibn Hajj says regarding these statements of our mother Aisha Radilaw Anha. Walaysa fiha ahad. As we sit in this narration, she said, I did not find anyone to respond or hear my hear me or hear my call like this. And here she says, Walaysa fiha ahad. There was no one there in the encampment. For in qila, and if it is said, this is what I, this is what we love, Ikhwan, about the works of the scholars. How the ulama ikhwan, they, they ask questions or they say, what if someone says this? And if someone was to ask this, and they answer those questions so as to refute that which may come. So Ibn Hajjah says, he says, for in qila, and if it was asked, Lima lam Aisha ma'aha ghayruha, why didn't someone accompany Aisha, yani, when she was going to the bathroom, amniha, that would have been better for her protection, than that which may happen to someone while they are by themselves. لَكَانَتْ لَمَّا تَأَخْرَتْ لِلْبَحْثِ عَنِ الْعِقْدِ تَرَّسَّلَا مَنْ رَافَقَهَا لِيَنْتَذِرُوهَا So he says that if there was someone with her, then while she was looking for her necklace, they would have been able to tell the army to hold up. As our mother Aisha was looking for her, uh, for her, uh, her necklace, and that would have been يعني, better for her protection, يعني, for her safety. He said, إِنْ أَرَادُ الرَّحِيلِ If the army intended to travel. وَالْجَوَابُ and he says the answer to this is sin. This can also be benefited from her statement that she was young in age. Shuf, look at all the benefits that Ibn Hajj is taking from her statement that she was young in age. Ibn Hajj said this can also be benefited from the statement that she was young in age because she didn't have that experience so therefore she had no need in her mind that she would need to have somebody to go with her. Right? She was a young girl. Uh, she was going out to go to the bathroom at that. So in her mind, there was no need to have someone to accompany her. But after some of these things had taken place, as we'll, as we'll see in a second, Ibn Hajjah mentions that someone will go out with her. So he says... So this is what happened afterwards, yani, later on, when she would go out to go to the, uh, to the, to, to relieve herself. Uh, she would take someone to accompany her. As we find in this very narration, in this very story that we are now reading, that she mentions that Umm Mistah went out with her when she would go out to take care of her needs. And we'll see this tonight, inshallah ta'ala, from this narration. So she says, and I return to the place where I was at before. And the reason why she mentioned this is one that she went back to that area it's because if they were going to come back, then they would most likely come back to the area where they left her. So that is very, again, a good presence of mind of our mother Aisha, radilaw anha. Again, our mother Aisha begins to speak. فَأَدْلَجْ فَأَصْبَحَ عِنْدَ مَنْزِلِي فَرَأَى السَّوَاد إِنْسَانْ نَائِمْ فَأَتَانِ فَعَرَفَنِ حِنْرَانِ وَكَانَ يَرَانِ قَبْلِ الْحِجَابِ فَاسْتِقَضْتُ بِاسْتِرْجَاعِهِ حِينَ عَرَفَنِي فَخَمَّرْتُ وَجْهِي بِالْجِلْبَابِ وَاللَّهِ مَا كَلَّمَنِي كَلِمَةً لَا سَمِعْتُ مِنْهُ كَلِمَةً غَيْرَ إِسْتِرْجَاعِهِ And this is a very nice statement. Wallahi, this is a beautiful statement from my mother Aisha, ya Akhwan. This narration, Akhwan, as we mentioned, has so many fawaid, subhanAllah. So Aisha says that when she was at this place and she was sleeping, that yani, the, the companion who came upon her, and what was his name again? Safwan, Safwan. That when he came upon her, he, she said, Ra'a sawad in san na'im. He saw a black figure sleeping. What do we benefit from the fact that she says he saw a black figure sleeping? Umar. She was wearing hijab and what else? Wa alaikum salam rahmatullah. Not yet. It was black, the obvious. That it was black. Now, ulama have mentioned it because this commonly comes up, the question of whether or not it is obligatory to wear black. Shaykh al-Earth mean, subhanAllah, he made a very nice statement regarding this issue of people asking, is something wajib or not? Is something wajib? Shaykh al-Earth mean, he said, that the, the companions didn't used to ask, is something wajib? Rather, if the Prophet commanded with it, or if it was from his sunnah, 
Then they used to try, they used to strive with all that was within themselves to implement the, the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Muhammad. And they wouldn't ask, is it wajib? Do I have to do it? Right? They would just strive with all that was in themselves, with every opportunity and effort to implement that which the Prophet Muhammad did. So there's no question, Ikhwan, that not only in this narration, but in other narrations, that it is mentioned time and time again that the, the women of the companions, the wives of the Prophet and the women of the companions wore black. It was from their way. It was from their way to wear this, this black. So therefore, my statement, Ikhwan, even if we're arguing, or even if a person is arguing that it's not obligatory, would not one want to imitate the best of women? Would not one want to be in the same vein, in the same light, in the same tradition as the best of women? And Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah made a very nice statement, Ikhwan. He says, no one imitates a people except that they love them. The imitation of a person is a sign that you honor a person. I mean, subhanAllah, how many times have we seen if one of these entertainers out here does something in the whole dunya, they change their ways and they begin to do the same thing as those people do because they love those people. So if one of you hears now that Aisha, the best of men, from the best of women, from the best of women, the, the beloved of the Messenger of Allah, Muhammad Wasallam, our mother Aisha, that she was one who wore black, it would, you would think that a woman would strive to be like Aisha, who want to look like her, want to dress like her, want to resemble her, want to imitate her, trying to be like the best of women. So therefore, this is a reminder for us, yeah, akhawat, to our sisters and to our brothers. That we're not saying, as Shaykh al-Albani mentions, we're not saying now that if a woman wears a dark color, a solid color other than black, that she is doing something wrong. La ya akhwan, barakallahu fikum. The point that we are making is that we are striving to the best of our abilities to imitate that generation. We're doing the best we can. Look at Ibn Umar. Look at Abdullah ibn Umar. That it mentions that the Prophet wasallam prayed underneath of a tree. And it mentions that Abdullah ibn Umar used to go and water that tree every day until he died. Trying to keep that tree alive just because the Prophet Sallam prayed beneath that tree. There's another narration that mentions that Ibn Umar, that the Prophet Sallam's camel had, had kneeled and, 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 and urinated in a particular area. That he brought his camel to that same area and waited for it to urinate. Trying to follow the Prophet Sallam. It is mentioned if uh, Dhabi brings into the Alam al Nubala. That they say that Ibn Umar followed the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam hatta khifa ala aqlih until people began to be worried about his, his mind because he was striving to follow the sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in such great detail. So the point that I'm making, Ya Akhwan, Walakawat, should we not strive to be like that generation? Should we not strive to be like that generation from the companions? So we say, Tayyib, Barakalafiq. So the people say, You don't have to wear Izar, you don't have to wear Thob, like this, Tayyib, Labats. But the point is, Ikhwan, is it not yani, something that we want to do and strive to do, to look like those people and to dress like those people, yani, as to try to be close to them because we love them and we love the way that they dress and the way that they talk and the way that they move and everything that they did because we know they did these things for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they were the best of, the best of generations. The Prophet Sallallahu said, Khairu nas qarni, the best of mankind is my generation. So again, Ikhwan wa khawat, we say this again as a reminder of striving to imitate and be like those generations. So she mentions now. Yani Zakwani. Cool. Man? Ibni Man? Ibni Ata? La. Mahu. We'll call it now. Ibni Ata. Ibni Ata. Ibni Ata. Ibni Ata. Sufwan ibn Mu'attal. As-Sulami. Thumma Zakwani. Now. So Aisha, she continues, Zakwan. And she mentions, فَأَتَانِ فَعَرَفَنِي So he came to me and he knew me. Now this answers what we were saying, Umar, that she, at that time she wasn't wearing niqab because she said, he saw me and he knew me. وَكَانَ يَرَانِي قَبْلِ الْحِجَابِ And he saw me before the ayat of hijab were revealed. Before the ayat of hijab were revealed. Now tonight, Ikhwan, I'm going to read uh, the ayat of hijab and some of the tafsir of the scholars regarding the ayat of hijab. Who knows what the ayat of hijab, what surah are they found in? Huh? La al-ahzab. Al-ahzab. You said al-ahzab, huh? It's al-ahzab. Somebody said nur, it's al-ahzab. It's surah al-ahzab. Ya ayyuhan nabi kulli azwajika wa binatika. It's the end of that. We'll talk about the, the verse in a bit, inshallah ta'ala. So she says, فَعَرَفَنِي حِنَ رَانِي So he knew me when he saw me, because he saw me before the ayat of hijab, or before the hijab, يعني, and we'll talk about that. So I awoke by his statement, 
inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Right? Istirja'ihi, when he saw me. فَخَمَّرْتُ وَجْهِ بِجِلْبَابِ And I covered my face with my jilbab. So, she, so this benefits us what? That she was muntaqibah. That she was wearing the niqab, covering her face, as we know from the ayat of hijab. And we'll talk about the, yani, the jilbab and what is the definition of jilbab, inshallah ta'ala, when we read those verses in the tafsir. So she says, وَاللَّهِ مَا كَلَّمَنِي كَلِمَةً And by Allah, he did not say anything else to me. He did not say another word to me other than his statement, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. From Allah we come and to Allah we return. That's all he said, Ikhwan. Huh? So now as for her statement, as for her statements, yani regarding, uh, yani her say, statement, they will come back to me, meaning come back to me, meaning the uh, Jaysh, the army. Qal Iyad, Iyad says, al-dhanhuna bi ma'na al-ilm. This is nice. He says that when she says, I thought that they would come back to me, he says, the dhan here, the thought here, yani bi ma'na al-ilm, with the meaning of knowledge. She was sure they were going to come back. When they realized that she was missing, they would be back. Huh? تَعَقَبَ بِاحْتِمَاتِ أَنْ يَكُونَ عَلَى بَابِهِ فَإِنَّهُمْ أَقَامُوا إِلَى وَقْتِ الظُّهْرِ وَلَمْ يَرْجِ أَحَدْ مِنْهُمْ إِلَى الْمَنْزِلِ أَلَّذِي كَانَتْ بِهِ وَلَا نَقَلْ أَنَّ أَحَدٍ لَاقَاهَا فِي الطَّرِيقِ But then some time had passed, as we said, some time had passed, and no one had come back. He says, لَكَنْ يُحْتَمُلْ أَنْ يَكُونُ إِسْتَمَرُّوا فِي السِّيرِ إِلَى قُرْبِ الظُّهْرِ So it could be understood that they continue to travel until close to Dhuhr. And it's something that's going to benefit this statement of Ibn Hajar here in a second. فَلَمَّا نَزَلُوا Meaning that they continue to travel. That's why they didn't come back quickly, because they didn't stop quickly. They continue to travel until Dhuhr. And it's something that's going to benefit us that, inshallah ta'ala, later on. فَلَمَّا نَزَلُوا يَلِي إِلَى أَنْ يَشْتَغِلُوا بِحَقْ رِحَالِهِمْ رَبَطَ رَوَاحِلَهُمْ وَاسْتَصْحَبُوا حَالَهُمْ فِي ظَنِّهِمْ أَنَّهَا فِي هَوْدَجِهَا لَمْ يَفْتَقِضُهَا إِلَى أَنْ وَصِلَتْ عَلَى قُرْبٍ وَلَوْ فَقَدُوهَا لَرَجْعُوا كَمَا ظَنَّتُوا And he goes on to mention the Quran that they continued to travel and so they finally stopped and it mentions that they were busy dealing with the affairs of traveling and the, uh, and the likes of this and so again they were not aware of her being missing in this haudaj, in this canopy. And if they had thought that she was missing, if they knew she was missing, we should say, then they would have returned for her, just as she thought, just as she knew they would return to her. And then he goes on to mention Ibn Hajar, وَأَرَادَتْ بِمَنْ يَفْقُدُهَا مَنْ هُوَ مِنْهَا بِسَبَبِ كَزَوْجِهَا وَأَبِيهَا As for those who she thought would miss her, yani who would find her, yani would, would, would miss her, meaning find her missing, would be someone who would have a reason to find her missing, which would be either her husband, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, or her father, Abu Bakr. So even as we see here in her, when she says that they would find me missing, what she intended was not those who were carrying the haudaj, but rather be one who would have the, the ability to know that she was missing, who would be able to speak to her or talk with her or like this and look in on her. And that would only be the messenger of Allah Muhammad وسلم, or her father, Abu Bakr. So Ibn Hajar, he continues, and he says, وَالْغَالِبُ الْأَوَّلِ And for the most part, we would think it would be the first, meaning the Messenger of Allah, Muhammad وسلم, لِأَنَّهُ كَانَ مِنْ شَأْنِهِ Because it was from his way. And this is a very nice point. كَانَ مِنْ شَأْنِهِ أَنْ يُسَايِرْ بَعِيرَهَا Because the Prophet وسلم, used to be the one himself who would actually direct, hold the reins and direct her camel. It would be him who would, who would actually be holding the reins and directing her camel. فَكَأَنَّ ذَلِكَ لَمْ يَعْنِي يَتَّفِقْ فِي تِلْكَ الْلَيْلَةِ And as if perhaps that particular evening the Prophet ﷺ was doing something else with the army and therefore he wasn't the one doing so. وَلَمَّا لَمْ يَتَّفِقْ يَعْنِي مِنْ يَعْنِي مِنْ رُجُوعِهِمْ إِلَيْهَا سَاقَ اللَّهِ إِلَيْهَا مِنْ حَمْلِهَا يعني بغير حول منها ولا قوة And therefore because of this she was therefore left يعني and she was by herself in that particular place. He continues. As for her statement, as I was sitting there in that place, then sleep overtook me. Ibn Hajar says, He says that perhaps the reason for her falling asleep was her severe sadness. She was very sad at being left there. Because she was very sad at that point, right? And he says, and from the affair of sadness, And he shows us the difference now because in the narration when the Prophet Sallam made dua from ghammi wal hum. From ghammi wal hum. The Prophet Sallam made dua against sadness and anxiety. 
So now Ibn Hajar is explaining to us the difference between the two. So people talk about going to these psychologists and psychiatrists and all these definitions. And here we see Ibn Hajar, these scholars from how many, how many centuries ago, Iqwan, talking about the difference between these affairs, right? So he says, as for sadness, sadness is after, is, is, is dislike of after something has happened, right? Sadness is when something has happened, you're sad about what has already taken place, right? And he says, being opposite from him, and anxiety, and he says, anxiety is when you fear what may happen, what may come. So the difference now, what the Sheikh is saying, is, yani al gham. Yani someone's house has been taken from them, burned down, for example. Right? They lost their house. The house is burned in the fire. Then they're sad because of what has happened from the fire. As for anxiety, then someone doesn't have the money to pay for their rent for next month. The money's not there, so they're anxious about it, about what is to come. Right? It hasn't happened yet. So these are the two. But listen to what Ibn Hajj says after this, Ikhwan. He says, as for yani sadness, and in most cases, people sleep. What do the people say are the signs of, of sadness and distress? People, they sleep a lot. Right? Spinal. Look, look, look at Ibn Hajar. How many centuries ago was Quran talking about the attributes and the symptoms of these, 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 these diseases of the mind? Then he says, which is opposite of anxiety because that necessitates what? Insomnia. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Ikhwan. Allahu Akbar. How many centuries ago? Ulama, ulama. All you have to do, Ikhwan, is see the fiqh and the ilm of these people, these men, these, these ulama, these scholars. Look at the explanation of Ibn Hajar when he explains the narration of the monkeys who stoned another monkey to death. He's a zoologist. He was a zoologist, Ikhwan. He knew the affairs of animals, broke down the history of, of apes and monkeys and the whole nine. Ah, Ikhwan, I advise anyone who has the opportunity and the ability to read those statements of uh, Ibn Hajar regarding those monkeys who stoned another monkey to death for fornication, for adultery. He continues. And he says, or perhaps from the, yani, the conditions out there, yani, it, was, yani, uh, it, was, it was humid or like this, that she fell asleep. He says that she covered herself with her jilbab. She fell asleep. Of course, and wrapped herself in her jilbab. And this is a very nice point that Ibn Hajjah says. Or perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was merciful to her and compassionate to her and allowed her to go to sleep so she would rest from the fear of being by herself in the desert in the dark. Allah Akbar. Very nice benefits, Ikhwan, in those regards from Ibn Hajar. Ibn Hajar continues, Qawluha, as for her statement, that he saw a dark figure, a black figure, a sawad beloved did the bayad, and he says that, of course, black is the opposite of white on the other end of the spectrum. Yutlaq ala shaks, yani, a shaks kan, a shaks kan, يعني, that which is described uh, about a human being. قالت, آدمي, that is if he has said she saw a black person. يعني, but didn't know whether, who it was, whether it was a man or a woman, as he wasn't up uh, close to the figure. قوله, or, قوله, as for her statement, رأني, that he knew me when he saw me. And this is a very nice point that Ibn Hajjah mentions. هذا يشعر بأن وجهها انكشف that her face yani, was uncovered as she, was, as she slept. Not that she uncovered it before she slept, but as she was sleeping and one moves around while they're sleeping, that the, the covering may have come off of her face at that particular time, right? That's a very nice benefit. Right. Uh, question. When one wakes up from sleep, what did Prophet Sallallahu say the first thing they should do? Wipe their face first. Hands first. No? There you go. So, so wipe the hands first because one does not know where their hands have been at night. One does not know where their hands have been at night. The whole point is that we do things in sleep, of course, it's subconscious. Unconscious. You're actually unconscious, right? So you do things unconsciously in one sleep that one does not know. So here, as uh, Ibn Hajar is saying, it is if it is understood that her face, Yani, in Keshef, that it was uncovered, not that she uncovered, it was uncovered while she slept. Because it already said that she covered herself with the jilbab when she slept, right? So that would appear that it came off again as she was sleeping, not that she took it off. As for a statement that he saw me before hijab, a qabla nuzul ayat al hijab. That he saw me before the verses that were revealed regarding hijab. 
وهذا يدل على قدم إسلام صفوان. And this indicates and points to what the Safwan was a companion for some time. That he has he was a companion for some time. And that's oh, the Islam of, of, of him. And he had um, and he accepted Islam earlier before the ayat of hijab were revealed. So that's a very nice benefit that Ibn Hajar mentions. That this shows the the the, the qadam. Yani the that he had a long period of Islam before him. فإن الحجاب كان في قول أبي عبيدة وطائفة في ذي القعدة سنة سنة ثلاث. And I was going to ask you guys a question, but now since I've already said it, what year for those who uh, what year was the ayat of hijab revealed? What year after the hijrah? I just said it. The third year after the hijrah. I guess that question wouldn't work, right? The third year after the hijrah. The third year after the hijrah. In what month? ذي القعدة. ذي القعدة. Yeah, best we should. That's a nice, nice benefit, huh? Nice benefit. Well, in the Akhirin fi has an arba, and others say it was in the fourth year. Others say in the fourth year. Well, Sahahu ad Dmiyati, and the Dmiyati says that this is what is correct, meaning the fourth year. Well, Qila bal kana fi sana khams, and some say no, rather it was in the fifth year. So there's three different statements that we find from the ulama. Some say the third year, some say the fourth year, some say the fifth year. ومما يؤيد صحة ما وقع هذا الحديث في هذا الحديث أن الحجاب كان قبل قصة الإفق قول عيشة أيضا في هذا الحديث أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم سأل زينب بن جحش عنها. This is a very nice benefit. He says what what benefits us also, what also supports, what also supports that the, that the uh, the ayat of hijab يعني happened before this story يعني meaning before the uh, the غزوة of, of بني مصطلق what happened that happened before it. Is what Aisha says in this narration that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, asked Zainab bin Tujash about Aisha. How do we benefit? How, how do we benefit that this, this, how does this aid and support that this narration that we're talking about, that the ayats of hijab were revealed before this story by the Prophet asking Zainab bin Tujash about Aisha? He knew who knew her. Who knew who? He knew who, who was. Who? Who? Speaking of who? Yeah, maybe the question wasn't a good question. Ibn Hajar says that what benefits us and supports that the ayats of hijab were revealed before this story that we're reading now, the Qisrat al-Ifq, is that the Prophet ﷺ said, he asked Zainab bin Tujash about Aisha. You know, I thought you get right. My brother said there was a revelation that was revealed. And he went straight home. Ahsent. There you go. Ibn Hajar mentions the Quran. He says, وَهِيَ أَلَّتِي كَانَ تُسَامِينِي مِنْ أَزْوَاجِ النَّبِي That Aisha says that she was the one who I had the most competition with. From the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, and she was, as she mentions, beautiful. فَكُلُّ ذَلَكَ الدَّالَ عَلَىٰ أَنَّ زَيْنَبْ كَانَتْ حِنَئِذٍ زَوْجَتُهُ All of this points to the fact that she was the wife of the Prophet at that time. That Zainab was the wife of the Prophet at that time. وَلَا خِلَابْ أَنَّ آيَةِ الْحِجَابِ نَزَلَ الْحِنَ دُخُولِهِ And there is no difference of opinion that the ayat of hijab revealed when the Prophet ﷺ entered upon Zainab. So therefore, she was already his wife, right? Zainab was already his wife for the Prophet ﷺ to ask her about Aisha. So that proves to us that the eyes of hijab had to have been revealed before this story happened. Allahu Akbar. Look how the ulama they look through the narrations and they bring all of these different benefits and all these connections. So then he says, And with this, it is established and affirmed, and confirmed, we should say, that the ayats of hijab were revealed before the story of the slander. So then he goes on to mention the statement of our mother Aisha. And I woke by his saying, from Allah we, from Allah we come and to Allah we return. يعني, and he says, وَكَأَنَّهُ شَقَ عَلَيْهِ مَا جَرَى لِعَيْشَ أَوْ خَشِ أَنْ يَقَعَ مَا وَقَعَ It is as if he was afraid to say anything else besides. He didn't want anything to happen. Afraid that someone may try to say something or accuse something or like this. So he, he merely said to her, from Allah we come and to Allah we return, and didn't say another word. So he had great wara, يعني, great concern regarding his religion. And everybody had the greatest concern, Ikhwan, regarding the person of our mother Aisha. Now, um, I don't know if you're jumping the gun, but uh, when he made Safwan Rasulullah and said, Inna lillahi wa inni lillahi wa rajiun, he didn't know if she was dead or 
Yeah, that's an, yeah, he brings that. He brings that. We'll mention that, inshallah. It's so okay to jump the gun sometimes. Mafi shade, alhamdulillah. So he says after this, Iqwan ibn Hajar, أو أنه اكتفى بالاسترجاع الرافع به صوت على مخاطبتها or as if he was sufficient with his saying from Allah we come and Allah we return raising his voice to the one he is speaking to بكلام آخر صيانة لها عن المخاطبة في الجملة again being careful not to speak to her other than these words وقد كان عمر يستعمل التكبير عند إرادة الإيقاظ and Umar used to like to use the takbir when he wanted to wake somebody up so here, so, yani, Safwan is, is using the, yani, the, the statement uh, 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 from Allah we come and to Allah we return. And Umar used to like to use the takbir. Allah Akbar! To wake a person up. Huh? And again, as you just mentioned, Isa, Jazakallah Khaira, this shows the great presence of mind of Safwan and his great adab with our mother Aisha. So it's the same as you mentioned, Isa, regarding those who carry the Hodaj. It was a great edib that they had regarding the person of our mother Aisha. فَخَمَّرْتُ She says, فَخَمَّرْتُ يعني أي غَطَيْتُ يعني Meaning, she covered her face. I mean, with her khimar. And we're going to discuss in a second, Ikhwan, uh, يعني, what is the difference between the jilbab and the khimar. As we know from the ayah, Al-Albani mentions this in Hijab Rasul Muslimah, that the jilbab actually covers what? The khimar. So the jilbab should be that which goes over the head. I mean, this is clear, right? That the, that the jilbab covers, and I'll say it again, the jilbab covers the khimar. Where is the khimar? Ala ras, upon the head. So where is the jilbab, therefore? Ala ras. As for that which is what they call the uh, jilbab al-itq, the shoulder ibaya, then their fatawa from the scholar is mentioning that this is not what is correct. It's like a thobe almost. It's like a thobe. As for the jilbab, we'll see in a second, is that which, as Al Albani mentions, that which covers يعني, the khimar. He says, she says, وَوَجْهِ بِالْجِلْبَابِ I cover my face. A, a thobe الذي كان عليها, meaning her garment that was upon her. وَقَدْ تَقَدَّمَ شَرْحَهُ فِي الطَّهَارَ And that which uh, has preceded in the book of Tahara has already explained that matter. As for the ayats of hijab, the ayat of hijab, uh, Surah Al-Ahzab What's the ayat number? Huh? Is it 58? Look and see if it's 58, Ikhwan I think it's 58 Al-Ahzab, I think it's ayat number Look and see ayat number 58 if you can, Ikhwan Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Ya ayu al-nabi Kulli azwajika wa binatika Wa nisa'a al-mu'mineen Yudnina alayhinna min jalabi bihinna ذلك أدنى أن يعرفنا فلا يؤذين وكان الله غفورا رحيما. Allah says, O Prophet, say to your wives and to your daughters and to the women of the believers to cover themselves with their jalabib, with their jilbabs, their overgarments, that they will be known and not be harmed. And Allah is all forgiving, all merciful. 58? 59. Number 59. Ahsan, Jazakallah 59. So it's Ahzab 3359. 3359. The great scholar of Tafsir, Imam al Mufassirin, the Imam of the Mufassirin, he said regarding this verse, the reason. Now, what is the reason for the revelation of this verse? What is the reason for the revelation of this verse? A Tabri says, That there were men from the Munafiqeen, from the hypocrites in Al Medina. Either, uh, yani, either Imra'a, Afwan Ikhwan, either Marrat Bihim Imra'a, Sayyatul Hay'a, was Zay, Hasib al Munafiqun, Ennaha Muzayyana, or Ennaha Min Bagyatihim, Fakanu Yuzuna al Mu'minat, the Rafaf. This is a very nice point, Ikhwan. He says, Tabari says, that there were men from the Munafiqeen, from the hypocrites. That if a woman passed by them and she wasn't dressed properly, she wasn't covered properly, or like this, they would think that she had beautified herself because she was a prostitute. They would think that she was beautifying herself because she was a prostitute. And what was happening was they would begin to be accosting the women. They would accost the women. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed these ayahs to do what? To distinguish the believing women from those women. From those women of the night. 
as they say. Huh? And also Ibn Kathir says, Ibn Kathir says regarding these verses, يَقُولُ تَعَالَ آمِرًا رَسُولَهُ Allah says commanding his messenger, أَنْ يَأْمُرَ النِّسَاءَ الْمُؤْمِنَاتِ خَاصَةً أَزْوَاجِهُ وَبِنَاتِهِ لِشَّرَفِهِنَّ بِأَنْ يُدْنِينَ عَلَيْهِنَّ مِنْ جَلَابِ بِهِنَّ لِيَتَمَيَّزْنَ عَنْ سِمَاتِ نِسَاءَ الْجَاهِلِيَةِ وَسِمَاتِ الْإِمَاءِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded his messenger to command the believing women and specifically his wives and his daughters because of their great status and nobility that they should cover themselves with their jalabib to distinguish them from the attributes of the women of the jahiliya. So one of the other benefits that we take from this covering of the women of the believers is to distinguish themselves from the attire and the dress of the women of al jahiliya the disbelieving women. And also from simat al ima and also from the attributes of the women who were slaves, as opposed to free women. Wal jilbab huwa. Now what is jilbab? Huwa rada fawq al khimar. It is the garment, the upper garment that goes over the khimar. It is the garment that goes over the khimar. Call Ibn Mas'ud. Ibn Mas'ud. Wa Ubaidah. Wa Qatada. Wa Hassan al Basri. Wa Sa'id ibn Jubair. Wa Ibrahim al Nakhai. Wa Ata al Khurasani. Wa Ghir Wahid. And this is what was stated, Ikhwan. This is what is stated. نعم هذا ابن كثير هذا لا هو ابن كثير هو يذكر عن ابن مسعود هذا ما قال ابن مسعود وعبيدة وقتادة والحسن البصري وسعيد بن جبير وإبراهيم النقعي Another than them, but the, the point is Ibn Hajj's uh, Ibn Ibn Kathir is bringing that that definition. Mention this is the statement of those individuals. Again, it is that garment that covers the khimar, and as they say, "Qala hu Ibn Masud wa Ubeida wa Qatad al Akhri." Qala Ali ibn Abi Talha. Qala Ali ibn Abi Talha عن ابن عباس. أمر الله نساء المؤمنين إذا خرجنا من بيوتهن في حاجة أن يغطين وجوههن من فوق رؤوسهن بالجلابيب. ابن عباس said that Allah commanded the believing women that if they leave their homes for a need, that they are to cover their faces from above their heads with their jalabib, with their jilbab. So the jilbab again should do what? Should cover their faces from above their heads. This is the tafsir of Ibn Abbas. We mentioned Ibn Mas'ud and others. And they uncover an eye, as we know, so as to see the road and the likes of this. Call him Muhammad ibn Sirin. And then Muhammad ibn Sirin says, He said, I asked Abida. السلماني عن قول عن قول الله تعالى on the statement of Allah سبحانه وتعالى يدين عليهن من جلابي بهن they cover themselves with the jilbab again محمد بن سيرين he asked عبيبة عبي عبيدة السلماني about that آية and he said فغطى وجهه ورأسه وأبرز عينه اليسرى that he didn't say anything to him but rather what he did was he went like this and he went like this 
So he demonstrated for him what he should do. That he should, that the woman should go like this and cover everything but the eye, the left eye. Uh, I didn't do it right. Cover every, uncover every, uh, cover everything but the left eye. So he himself, when he was just demonstrating, when Abi that Salmani was demonstrating for Muhammad ibn Sinin how it should go, again he covered his face and he left the left eye open. قال ابن أبي حاتم ابن أبي حاتم says عن أم سلمة قالت أم سلمة said لما نزلت هذه الآية when these ayahs were revealed يعني and covered themselves with their jalabib خرج نساء الأنصار كأن على رؤوسهن الغربان من السكينة that when the women of the Ansar came out it is if they had crows on their heads as if they had crows on their heads وعليهن أكسيا سود يلبسنها and they were wearing what color clothing black they were wearing black clothing. So here's another narration that points or demonstrates something of what we talked about earlier. And it's interesting that was that, that was she dumbest. She called them crew, the, the crows on like crows on the heads. Now, a Siddi says, Ya uh, from these verses, Kala can a nasman for Saka Hal Medina, Yahrojuna Bilal, Hina Yan Yahtalat, a Vulam in a Turk Al Medina. Again, he says, a Siddi says, uh, after these verses, that there were a group of fusaq, yani, yani sinners, wicked sinners from the people of Medina. And Tabari says they were munafiqeen. Here it says wicked sinners from the people of Medina that will come out by night when it got dark and they would begin to yani, walk in the par- passageways. And it mentions that the passageways of Medina were dhayqa, that they were very narrow. They were very narrow. The passageways were very narrow. So that would give them the opportunity to do what? Get a little feel, right? As we say, copper feel, right? So it goes on to mention, Again, the, the, the quarters were close and therefore the passageways were tight. So for either can a lail kharaj and nisa ila turaq, and he said the women will come out to take care of their needs. And the wicked ones would like follow them up and, and chase after them and like this to try to do what they could do with them. But if they saw a woman with a jilbab, they would say, La hurra, kufu anha, la. She's a free woman from the believers, leave her alone. Leave her alone. Don't touch her. Well, but if they saw a woman that didn't have that on her, then they would say, Emma, yani she's a slave girl like this. And then they would try to do what they would try to do with her. So then he goes on to mention, Ikhwan, Wa kan Allah ghafur al rahima and Allah is all forgiving, most merciful, eh? meaning, Ibn Kathir says, Meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yani, has taught them that which they did not know in the days of al jahiliyyah So that is what we mentioned the Quran regarding the ayat of hijab. And as we said, some say third year, some say fourth year, some say fifth year. Allah knows best. We continue with the statement of our mother Aisha. And really, we don't have that much left for tonight. I want to finish inshallah ta'ala, if we can at least a few more statements. She says, And then she mentions, our mother Aisha says, And he therefore, he caused the camel to kneel. He caused the camel to kneel and then he put يعني, his feet on the legs of the camel. In other words, to keep the camel from Yani standing up to make it kneel and stay where it was at. And then Aisha said, and I got up on the camel. And then we rode off until we met up with the army. After they had taken rest during the midday heat. After they had taken rest during the midday heat. And even Manoah, he says, Ikhwan al and Noah, he says, this is a very nice point. He says, fi zahira, that they took rest during the midday heat. And nazil fi waqt al waghra shiddat al har. That what is intended by this yani, this mughirin is that it was extremely hot. This is during the time of Zuhur, near the time of Zuhur. And again, this benefits us, Ikhwan, that even though it was extremely hot, that the women still dressed how? They still dressed in black and they still dressed in full hijab. Full, full hijab. This, Ikhwan, reminded me when I, when I read this, Ikhwan, I thought about that which we constantly hear the women saying, the, the, the kufar women saying about our sisters. I know you got to be hot in that stuff. I know you have to be hot in that stuff. This is the way that they talk to our sisters. But just as a reminder, oh akhawat, oh sisters, 
Remembering that this is the way of our mothers, the way of the mother of the, be- the mothers of the believers, that they would dress in this fashion even during the extreme heat of the Arabian Peninsula. Even during the hottest times of the Arabian Peninsula, and they did not complain. As we know from the narration of Ghazwa to Tabuk, yani the, the, the Battle of Tabuk, that when it was mentioned regarding those who were going to travel across the desert during the hottest months, the hardship army, as it was called, during the hottest months, and people were complaining about how hot it was. What did Allah say regarding it? What did Allah say about it? But the hellfire is hotter. But the hellfire is hotter. So we say to our sisters, this is a nice reminder for them that when someone says to them, I know you hot in that, you remember what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said regarding that, but the hellfire is hotter. And this is a tremendous encouragement for our sisters, again, that the mothers of the believers, that the women of the believers, that they were patient and they didn't complain. You don't hear anything of them complaining of the likes of this, of covering themselves even in the times of the extreme heat. As they were doing this for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were doing this for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and therefore, ya akhwan wa akhwat, as we are saying here, that they were patient in that regard and we do not read in the narration where they were complaining about wearing the jilbab in the heat. Now. Not only that, that's a very nice point. Uh, Isa mentioned about Yani skin being exposed and can cause skin cancer. Even on top of that, how do you see the uh, the Bedouin uh, uh, camel farmers? How do they dress in the desert? They covered all the way up. Why? Protection from that sun, as you mentioned. So it actually it makes more sense to be covered up, right? It makes more sense to be covered up. Barakalafikum. So that again, that argument that these kufar, these women that they use, yeah, I mean, it's truly an opposition. And the proof of that is in the winter, they're not saying, I know you might you must be warm in that, right? They don't they never say that. It's always the negative side of it, right? Well, I'm sorry. Nah. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. Allah. I know you cold in that. This is what you say to them. I know you cold with nothing on, right? <laughs> Allah Mustah. So Aisha, she says, فَهَلَكَ مَنْ هَلَكَ وَكَانَ ذِي تَوَلَّ الْإِفْقَ عَبْدَ اللَّهِ ibn أُبَيْ إِبْنِ سَلُولِ And she said, so after this, Aisha mentions, and then those who fell into destruction, those who were destroyed who fell into destruction, meaning from accusing me, and from the one who took the greater portion of that, of the slander, was Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. And I'll talk about his, uh, yani his death next class inshallah ta'ala because there's an interesting uh, connection to when he died uh, what happened uh, anyone know what happened between when, when, when Umar when his son came and asked about Wasallam? anybody know the story his son came and asked about to let him bury him in his we'll read it next week I thought the brothers would know It'll be, we'll read it next week inshallah ta'ala we'll mention some benefit regarding that some ayahs that will reveal regarding that issue and we'll end on this point here. Yani those who were destroyed, they were from, from those who were destroyed from those who slandered our mother Aisha. Yani Zadu Salih fi riwayatihi fi sha'ni. Yani regarding me, meaning regarding me, regarding those who slandered our mother Aisha. And then she says, in another, in another wording it says, فَهُنَالِكْ قَالَ فِيَّ Yani those who said what they said about me. وَفِيهِ أَهْلُ الْإِفْقِ مَا قَالُوا And what the people of If, the great slander, said about me. فَأَبْهَمَتْ القائل. So in this wording of the narration, yani she only mentions Abdullah ibn Ubayy and not the others. She just says those who, yani, who, uh, who slandered from the great slander. وَمَا قَالَتْ أَشَّارَتْ بِذَلَكَ إِلَى الَّذِينَ تَكَلَّمُوا بِالْإِفْكِ وَخَاضُوا فِي ذَلِكَ yani Pointing to those who spread these rumors. أَمْ أَسْمَعُهُمْ فَالْمَشْهُورِ As for their names, and they, then their names are well known. Who knows any of the names besides Abdullah ibn Ubayy? Ibn Salul. Mistah, who was the, the, the son of Um, um, um Mistah, yani, now who went out? Hey, now. Who else? Any other names? Hmm. Hassan ibn Thabit. Hassan ibn Thabit. Hassan ibn Thabit. And Hamna bint Jahsh. Aywa. Wa fi nas akhirin. And others, la ilma li bihim. Which I have no knowledge who these others were. Ghayr anahum usbah. 
Except that they are a group, as Allah has said. Allah called them what in the Quran? Usbatun minkum, right? A party from amongst us. We read the verses, the tafsir of those verses last week, right? That they are a party from amongst you. And Ibn Hajar says that, yani, the meaning of usba min thalath ila ashra, that usba in the Arabic language normally means from three to ten, from three to ten people. And it could just be a group of people without any specific number. But in a lot of cases, as he says, it is from three to ten. So at any rate, he says that the one who carried the most of that was uh, Abdullah ibn Ubay. Now let me just finish this last point, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, it's a very nice point that, he, that uh, Ibn Hajar makes here. As for our statement, Abdullah ibn Ubay, yani ibn Salul, he says, سَيَّاتِ بَعْدْ أَرْبَ أَبْوَابِ and he says that he's going to mention the different statements regarding the meaning of the one who took the greatest portion, right? And this is a very nice point. And this goes back to what we have been talking about in the previous weeks. That what is intended, one of the meanings that is intended by this Abdullah ibn Ubay, that he was from those who took the greater portion of the sin. Listen to what Ibn Hajar says. That what has been mentioned by Az-Zuhri and Urwa is that she is informing that this word was being spread and being spoken in front of him, meaning in front of Abdullah ibn Ubay. And he did what? He affirmed it. He listened to it. He spread it, and how did he do that, Ikhwan? He, he was seeking out trying to find out what happened. He was going about trying to find out what happened. So here we see Ikhwan, Ibn Hajjah says, yani, He was investigating, we keep saying this word investigating, he was investigating the matter, trying to find out so he could spread more. So this shows that when part of the sin, as he carried, the, as it says in the ayah, he carried the most of the sin. Mu'adhamahu, right? What was the reason? This was part of the reason, Ikhwan. Not only was he spreading it around, not only was he mentioning it, but he was the one who was investigating, trying to find out more and more about it so he could spread more and more. So this shows us the evil, Ikhwan, of those who go about and search and seek after these matters, as we talked about before. And what fi riwa ibn Ishaq, and in the wording of ibn Ishaq, kana ladhi yatawalla kibru dhalika abdul ibn Ubay, and he says, and as for the one who took the greater portion, again, it is Abdullah ibn Ubay, yani, uh, amongst the men uh, or the people of the Khazraj, yani, from the uh, Khazraj, the Khazraj, from the people of the Ansar. Tayyab, we'll end here, inshallah ta'ala. And if there's any questions or issues, Ikhwan, let's take them now. There you are. That's an excellent question. A very excellent question. The brother asked, if someone gets the label of the name Namam, for example, and similarly, let's just say it, let's put it out there, other names. A thief. Sometimes people call people a thief. A fornicator. All these names that people mention regarding individuals. The question is, how long do the likes of these names stay upon a person? Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he talks about this issue and he, regarding the affair of Toba. Regarding the affair of Toba. And he says that what the Salaf used to do is that they would look at a person's activities or actions for a period of time. They would look at a person's activities for a period of time. One of the examples that the ulama bring, I'll come back to the same Ibn Taymi in a second. One of the, the, the evidence that the ulama bring to substantiate what I'm about to say is the narration of the woman named Fatima who had her hand cut off for stealing. Who was she stealing from? Who knows who she stole, what she stole and where, where she stole from? No one knows this narration. She stole something, they say, from one of the houses of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, right? That she stole from this affair. And it mentions that she was going to get her hand cut off. And there were those who were trying to do what? There were those who were trying to stop it. They were trying to intercede on her behalf. And they wanted to send who to intercede? Who did they want to send to the Prophet to try to convince him not to cut off her hand? Huh? Zaid. Why? Huh? Come on, Ikhwan, why? He was the beloved of the Messenger of Allah Muhammad. If, he, if, he could, if anyone could do it, it would be him, right? The beloved of the Messenger of Allah Muhammad. 
So the point is that when he came, the Prophet Muhammad said that the people of the past, of Bani Israel, that if a noble one from amongst them was caught stealing, shukran, if the noble one from amongst them was caught stealing or, or caught doing something, they would give them the punishment. I mean, if a lowly person was caught doing something, they would give them the punishment. As for the noble ones from amongst them, then they would not implement the punishment. And the Prophet said, Wallahi, if Fatima stole, if my daughter stole, I would chop off her hand. All right? So what happens is Fatima is given, this Fatima is given the punishment. Not, of course, the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ, but this Fatima is given the punishment. It mentions in the narration, Aisha says that after this, she used to come around to the house of the Prophet ﷺ, she would ask questions about religion. She would ask about questions of religion. And Aisha said, if it were Hassanat Tawbah, Tawbah to her. She came with a beautiful Tawbah. She came with a beautiful Tawbah. All right. The point that I'm making to say this, Ikhwan, and I'll come back to the statement of Ibn Taymiyyah in a second. Is that Khatib al Baghdadi in his book Al Kifaya? Khatib al Baghdadi in his book Al Kifaya. He says that if an individual, a narrator, falls into a major sin, and he mentions men, men liwaq from homosexuality, or men, men sadaqa from stealing, from zina, from fornication, the likes of this, that his narrations are dropped as his adala is gone, his trustworthiness is gone. He says, but, either hasanat tawbatahu, but if his tawbah is a good tawbah, and he demonstrate a good tawbah, his honor comes back to him. His honor comes back to him. Now, what Ibn Taymiyyah and the scholars say is what the Salaf would do is they would look at an individual for some time, as we see in the narration of the woman who got her hand cut off. They would, they would look at her and see her activities after. And they would notice had, that she had changed. Now, Ibn Taymiyyah says some of the scholars would look at a person for a year's time. See how they do for a year. For example, for example a year. And they base that upon the narration of Sabiq ibn Asal. Sabiq ibn Asal. The one who spoke about the ayats in the Quran and Umar beat him and he passed out and Umar beat him and he passed out. Umar sent a letter to the people um, that if he's you know, to uh, abandon him for one year's time, abandon him for one year's time. And it says in, 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 in the narration that if he sat down and we were 100, we would all stand up and walk away from him. Everybody would get up and leave for a year's time. So they were watching for a year's time. Also, some of the ulama mentioned from them, Sheikh Rabi Sheikh Rabi mentioned the narration of the apostation, those who apostated. After the death of the Messenger of Muhammad, there were tribes from amongst the Arabs who said, listen, we're not going to give the, uh, the zakat anymore because we were giving that to the Prophet because it was the Prophet. We ain't giving it to nobody else. Abu Bakr said, if you, don't, if you hold back one ring that you used to give to the Prophet, we're going to fight you, right? I'm going to fight you. Now, what happens is after this, some of them came and made tawbah. Abu Bakr said to them, Abu Bakr said to them, after they made their tawbah, give me your weapons. And go out in the fields and hold on to the tails of the animals until Allah shows the Khalifa of the Messenger of Allah Muhammad Sallallahu what he needs to see. What was he talking about? He wanted to see that their tawbah was as clear as the sun of the sky. That when their tawbah was clearly seen from them, that they had repented and left off that and were no longer upon that, then he would give them back their weapons and the likes of this. But until then, you just go out there and just farm. Hold on to the tails of the animals, right? So the point I'm saying in all of these narrations that I'm bringing is that an individual is given that name as long as they are upon that. Once they repent and show good conduct and good character, it is no longer permissible to call that person a namam. They're not a namam anymore. They've repented from that. They have repented from that. And just like we see in the narration of the man who killed 99 people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave him for that which he had done, as we see in that particular narration. And therefore, one would no longer say he was a murderer at that time or after his repentance. Wallahu alam. Now, I mean, these narrations that we're mentioning right. prove that that's not the case. I mean, I, I don't know where that came from. I used to say that. I haven't heard that in years, though. Still There's still people from, from amongst the, the... I haven't heard that in years. Allahu Alam, I haven't heard that in years. Allah knows best. I think that's pretty clear, inshallah. No. Now, actually... Um, uh, there, uh, in these te the tafsir of these particular ayah, there is much speech regarding that, that of course the woman, uh, she does not have to cover as the believing woman has to cover. And there's a lot of kalam on that. There's a lot of speech on that. Perhaps we'll look at it in the future. There's a lot of speech on that. Actually, it's here in the papers, but I kind of skipped over that. But she doesn't cover as the believing woman has to cover. And it's a distinguishing between the slave and the freed woman.
Ubay ibn Salul. <laughs> he was from them, but it was being mentioned in his presence, and he was the one that began to spread it and began to make tafsheesh to sort of investigate, look, look into it. Oh, no, I haven't. I, inshallah ta'ala, we will. I haven't. Jazakallah khair. I've tried, but I haven't had the opportunity to get anybody on the phone yet. Inshallah ta'ala, I'll get that, inshallah. Brother Khalafi. Ibn Taymiyyah. You know, Ibn Taymiyyah said, um, you, you will not find a people imitating a people except that they love them. Ibn Taymiyyah mentioned that in Iqtidah, Salat al Mustaqim. Yani, uh, following the uh, uh, the path of uh, the straight path, um, he mentioned that in regards to imitating the kufar, he was saying that that there's a psychological yani, superiority. A person has a psychological superior, uh, inferiority com. That's the word inferiority complex. When you imitate someone, then you feel that you are inferior to them, or they are better than you. So if you imitate the disbelieving people. Yani, as Ibn Taymiyyah is saying, then that's a proof that you think they're better than you. Because why would you imitate somebody you think was beneath, beneath you? Right? If you thought somebody was less than you, then you, you wouldn't follow them. You wouldn't be like them. But the fact that, that, that you honor them and you think that they have something going on, then you imitate them in those affairs. So that's what Ibn Taymiyyah means when he says that. Naam, Al Albani mentions that. Al Albani mentions that. What well, we said last night, يعني, that that amal bin samim al iman, that actions are from the core of faith. Actions are from the core of faith. We mentioned the verse, the ayah in the Quran, that Allah will not allow your iman to be lost. Iman there meaning salah. Those who died praying still towards the Qibla to Jerusalem. So the companions. Ask what about their salat? Will it be lost? And Allah says that Allah will not allow the iman to be lost. And the iman is salat. And salat is standing, it is bowing, it is prostration, it is physical action, right? Actions with the body parts. Al Albani also, as we talked about last night, uh, Al Albani mentions uh, from the hadith uh, in Sahih Muslim and Abi Huraira, Inna Allah la yandur ila ajsamikum wa la ila yani surikum wa la kan yandur ila kulubikum. وَأَعْمَالِكُمْ And that's the most the thing that Al-Albani mentions, that addition there at the end. That Allah does not look at your shapes or your forms, but rather He looks at your hearts and your actions. So actions are most certainly yani, from the affair of Al-Iman, from the affair of Al-Iman. And Al-Albani goes on to mention that if we don't understand it that way, then when you command a person, and he mentions, when you command a person not to imitate the kufar, when you command a person to grow their beard, when you command a person to raise their lower garment, they say, what it concerns you is what's in my heart. That's what they say. Allah looks at the hearts. And that's why you have to understand it with that last part of the narration, وَعَمَالِكُمْ And your actions, right? From the way you dress, from the way you act, and not imitating the disbelieving people. Right? And that, it, because, again, the, the issue of imitating the disbelieving people is, is, is very interesting, Iqwan, that we need to remember not only did the Prophet not imitate the kufar, he went out of his way to be opposite from them. He went out of his way to be different from them and to the point where the Jews said there's not anything from our affair except this man Muhammad opposes us in it. There's not anything that we do except this man opposes us. So even the Yahud, the Jews understood what the Prophet was doing. They even saw it. So therefore we as Muslims again, and I wish we would have got to this tonight because it was a benefit that Aisha says that they didn't even keep their bathrooms in the house. They didn't put their bathrooms in the house because they were upon the affair of the Arab, the, the Arabs, the old, the first generation of the Arabs. And what she meant by that is we didn't follow the ways of the, the Ajami, the non-Arabs from outside of Arabia who put their bathrooms in their houses. We still put our bathrooms outside, out in the far distances. So she's showing how far they went not to be like the Ajami, the, the, meaning the disbelievers from the, uh, from the non-Arabs. Ghero, anything else? This, if this, I don't know if the sisters had anything. I don't know if anybody checked to see if they had anything. There was one other issue that came up. I guess the brothers, they keep forgetting. You know, they'll say something to me after the class is over about fasting on your Sept. No? Yeah, they'll say something as soon as the class is over. <laughs> Last week, I kept saying over and over again, is there anything else? Is there anything else? Nothing. Why didn't you talk about fasting on Sept? Tell you, ask the question. So the brothers are asking. Hold on, let me, let me deal with this first, inshallah. So the brothers, they asked regarding fasting on Yom Sept, again, uh, meaning 
by itself, yani, fasting by itself on Yom uh, There's a debate, a very yani, well-known debate, that I'm, sure, I'm sure you know by now, the debate between Sheikh Al-Albani and Sheikh Abdul Muhsin Al-Abbad. Sheikh Al-Albani and Sheikh Abdul Muhsin Al-Abbad. And it happened in the house of Sheikh Suhaimi. So you know who's in now. You hear the names that's in the room, right? Sheikh Al-Albani, Sheikh Suhaimi, Sheikh Abdul Muhsin, ulama, right? So they're having a debate surrounding the issue of fasting on Saturday. So Al-Albani is saying that fasting on Saturday by itself yani, is not permissible. And he mentions from the hadith of the Prophet Sallam, yani, naha, yani, an suyam yom as-sabt, yani, infiradin illa mafturida alayk. Yani, it is not permissible or prohibited, the Prophet Sallam prohibited from fasting on the day of Saturday except what has been made obligatory upon you, meaning during Ramadan, right? From the obligatory fast. So, Sheikh Al-Albani goes on to say that there is another narration that makes ta'keed or emphasis or stresses the impermissibility of that. And he brings a narration where the Prophet ﷺ said that you should break your fast even if you have to eat from the bark of a tree, right? Or from the leaves of the tree, whatever, whatever they call it, right? The bark of a tree. All right? So, Al-Albani is saying this hadith is emphasis, Emphasis, right? On top of the narration that he prohibited it, now he's saying if you got to eat from the bark of a tree, don't fast, right? So Sheikh Al Bani goes on to say that there's a qaida fiqhiyah, that there is a principle in fiqh that anahyun muqaddamun al ibaha, that the negation or the prohibition takes precedence over the permission to do something. Because Sheikh Abdul Muhsin came back and he said, well, wait a minute, because yani, now you have certain days. The Prophet ﷺ said that you should fast from them, Ashura, huh? Arafah, right? So we have these certain days, right? So Al Albani is saying, even on those days, you shouldn't fast if it's sept, if it falls on sept, if it falls on Saturday. And he said, the reason why, he said, even though you're mentioning now of the permission or even the istihbab, the liking of fasting on those days, we have a clear prohibition from the Messenger of Allah, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi a clear prohibition from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Shaykh Al-Albani says the qa'ida is there, the proof is there, that the prohibition takes precedence over the permission or the ibaha to do something. So Shaykh Abdul Muhsin, again, uh, Shaykh Abdul Muhsin, this, this, is a, this is a muhadith, ikhwan. this is an alam, muhadith of Medina. So he says to Shaykh Al-Albani, tayyib, who preceded you? Who preceded you in this statement from the scholars? So Sheikh Al-Albani, Rahimah Ta'ala, and I'll be honest, when we heard this, we were like, subhanAllah, we didn't know where it was going to go from here, right? Al-Albani says, well, that depends. Do you consider the narrator, the companion to be a scholar? Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Oh, khalas, right? So then after this, Sheikh Abdul Muhsin and some others say, well, yani, other than the companion, or like this, right? So then what happens is you have someone in the room. And again, the reason why I mention this is to show you something about Al-Albani. Sheikh Earth Amin said about him, he was qawil iqna'a. He was strong in argument. He was strong in convincing a person. And he mentioned that somebody in the room tried to interject and to say something. Sheikh Al-Albani said, Ya Ustad, a sual inda Sheikh Abdul Muhsin. He said, so and so. The question's with Sheikh Abdul Muhsin. So he's removing all the side stuff from the conversation. This is between me and Sheikh Abdul Muhsin here, right? So Sheikh, Sheikh Al-Albani knew how to command a room, Ikhwan. He knew how to, yani, to, 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 to deal with the yani, debate and the likes of this. So he said, yeah, Ustad. He said, the question is now between me and Sheikh Abdul Muhsin. So at any rate, Sheikh Abdul Muhsin said, but the benefit of fasting on these days is tremendous. I mean, how can you get beyond the benefit of fasting on these days, Brother Sallam mentioned? Al-Albani said, I understand it this way. The Prophet Muhammad Sallam said, من ترك الشيء لله عوضه خيرا منه Whoever leaves something for the sake of Allah, Allah will give him better than it. And I hope that for leaving this for the sake of Allah, from the command of the Prophet Muhammad that I will be given better than the blessings of fasting that day. So, ala kulli hal, this is the, the conversation, or part of the conversation, yani, the khulasa, the summary of what happened between them. So we see um, that the fasting on sept, unless it is that which is obligatory, is not correct. Wallahu, Allahu a'lam, and Allah knows best. Nah, what do you want to say? Oh, tell you, tell you. Other than that, Ikhwan, khalas, next week, inshallah.